Oh, you're too kind. Oh, my goodness. I hope you feel the same way about 18 minutes from right now. That would be nice. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I know what you're thinking. What could I, Gary Butterworth, possibly have to say about our subject here today that hasn't been said already? And you know, uh, coincidentally, I was thinking the same thing, actually, walking right up to the podium a moment ago. So, uh, but the show must go on anyway. So well, let's go ahead and uh, <laughs> go ahead and bring what we have planned for you here, just so your time isn't wasted. Um, I, I really, I'm sort of a newbie here with uh, List Skill Path, and I do appreciate very much you inviting me uh, in. And so in the spirit of just sharing ideas, that's why I'm here. I'm not here to teach you anything, but I'm certainly uh, happy to be here and to share some ideas with you. So uh, my, my presentation here today has three brief points here, and that those are the process, uh, creating a great first impression, pursuing customer feedback, and using w winning strategies, uh, many of which we just heard about from Anita, which I thought was just terrific, uh, to deliver tailored training. And so if we talk about the first one, creating a great first impression, you know, my sense is when we're talking about <clears throat> creating a great first impression, we really have two alternatives to work with. And let me demonstrate for you what those might be. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Gary Butterworth, and I seek first to understand. And I'm Glib Gary Butterworth, and I seek first to be understood. You know, the only way to get someone to understand is when I'm sitting there talking to the audience, relating to the audience, learning what their needs are, their concerns are, and demonstrating that I, in fact, actually care for them. And when I'm playing Glib Gary Butterworth, I get to read my resume. Hey, I was on-site trainer of the year in 2015. And I hold a master's degree in communication studies from California State University, Northridge. Oh, and as if that wasn't enough, thank you very much. Northridge fans out there, Matadors, yes, go. Uh, the other thing is 10 years on camera as a TV weathercaster. And oh yes, let's not forget 10 years playing the hits as a radio disc jockey on Boss Radio. <laughs> Don't be like that, me. <laughs> Get rid of your resume and seek first to understand before being understood. So creating the first impression I think is very important. It often leads right to the very next point that I want to discuss with you in a moment, and that is how we pursue feedback. And so for me, I don't want to gamble with the 7-Eleven rule of customer service. I don't know how many of you are familiar with this. I suspect many of you are. But there are essentially 11 impressions that are created in the first seven seconds of contact with the customer. And so the customer is sizing me up, making conclusions about me. Is Gary, uh, does he have a positive attitude? Is he organized? Gee, I wonder how credible he is. Is he knowledgeable? Does he know what he's talking about? Is he responsive? Is he friendly? And I'm wondering also if he's going to be helpful with me. I wonder if he really truly understands where I'm coming from. Does he appear to be courteous, confident, and most important of all, is he professional? And of course, the customer is sizing us up within the first seven seconds and first seven feet of us meeting them. So you're probably thinking, well, OK, fine. Well, what's the big fuss about the 7-Eleven rule? Well, is that wise old sage, Napoleon Dynamite, uh, once shared with us years ago, you never get a chance to make a you never get a second chance to make a first impression. Actually, it wasn't Mr. Dynamite. It was this other guy you might have heard of, Mr. Rogers, that actually coined that phrase. But nonetheless, uh, I would always be concerned about my first impression leading to the pursuit of customer feedback. So I like to listen like Pareto. I'm thinking the old 80-20 rule all the way here. 80% listening, 20% actually talking. And of course, the 20% that I'm talking, I'm actually carefully, uh, strategically, asking insightful questions designed to get the client to sort of open up a little bit and share with me many of the things Anita was talking about just a moment ago. So what's the secret to achieving 100% satisfaction? in the on-site seminar every time. I've been teasing you long enough, so here it is. This just in, ladies and gentlemen, here it is. Pop the $64 question. Yes, that's right. What we want to be doing is asking the decision maker on the tailoring call, what do you want your people to be doing differently after the day of training? And how will that change help your organization?
Now, this is a pencil message. You might want to write this one down, so let me repeat this one. What do you want your people to be doing differently after the day of training, and how will that change help your organization? I have found that by asking that particular question, for me, is the biggest single difference maker in terms of whether or not we're getting 100% satisfaction actually in the day of training. So the DM's answer then really represents the vision of how the seminar will ideally look, how it will sound, how it will, yes, as Matt said, play out kind of in the room, how the audience might perceive it and feel about uh, the day of training. The other thing I like to do is make the DM my coach. And of course, when we're talking about feedback, sometimes it's not that easy getting feedback from the decision maker, as I'm sure many of you have experienced. So why would I want to make him or her my coach? Because now, again, I, I realize I very much appreciate what Anita said a moment ago about the attendees, of course. We also have to be able to satisfy them, too. It's been my experience, however, not to be contradictory, but that the actual evaluations from the attendees, though they are very important, there's no question about that, that my primary customer, at least from my experience, from my perspective, is the DM. And the participants, of course, are very important, but I'm looking to satisfy that guy right there first. Now, when do I do this? Well, all day long. I'm constantly reminding the folks why we're here, what we're trying to accomplish. And what's really cool about this, from my point of view, is if I'm able to ask that $64 question, then the seminar just sort of unfolds the way the decision maker had envisioned it because the decision maker essentially told me what they wanted. And also, as Matt mentioned yesterday, I'm a huge note taker on the tailoring call, page after page after page. And to the point where I'm incorporating a lot of this actually into my PowerPoint. I think sometimes the decision makers are quite surprised uh, that I'm in that meticulous. A lot of people make, uh, I think, a mistake, a mistaken assumption about me. They see this guy coming up here, hey, he's Mr. Showman. And so he's probably just a superficial guy just going for a few laughs or whatever. Uh, well, that may be true. I mean, you may get that perception. But I actually do a lot of homework. I put a lot of time into these. And I think I catch a lot of people off guard. Uh, with using humor and some of the things that I use in the room. And I think people are sometimes surprised uh, at the end of the day what they've actually learned and what they have discovered for themselves. So I give them permission to give me advice. That's what I want. So it's all about me using my people skills, kind of getting to know uh, the DM. And I check in with them all day long. During the breaks, if I'm lucky enough to be invited to lunch with them, as I often am, uh, I let them coach me. I let them tell me what they can do to make this, uh, help me make this better. So there are things that come up, of course, during the day that we hadn't planned on. And so as our old friend, Jeffrey Lebowski, might, uh, <laughs> might say, of course, everybody knows what's coming next, what to do. Well. That's right, the trainer abides, yes, indeed. The trainer adjusts, adapts. And so I'm going to remind the participant, participants all day long how making this specific change is going to help them and the organization. It's that constant sort of reinforcement. Uh, Nota bene, I know we have a Latin background person in here or two, which of course means that's right, note well. Yes, note well in Latin, exactly. <laughs> very nice, very nice. Uh, coaching the audience a little bit here. So here's the deal. We want to be aware of these silent unhappies. Very, very troubling. No news is certainly not good news, at least in my world, when I'm talking about my relationship uh, with the decision maker. And so silence in this context is not golden. What I want to do is not go for gold, but go for silver. And as we all know, silver is, that's right, silver is, <laughs> silver is speech. <laughs> Silver is speech in the classical context. Yes, you can look it up after, Google it after we're done here. I often find that the decision makers are often HR people, uh, really nice people, very friendly people, warm, sensitive. But they're not likely to give me the sort of advice that I want uh, if I don't create that sort of relationship with them, especially they're not going to give it to me in the class in front of other people. So I want to really kind of make them feel safe to have that conversation with me. Uh, offline, presumably. Then the last point I wanted to make here in our three-point process is use winning strategies. Again, we've heard so many excellent strategies already, and I know we have more to come, too, uh, with Darla in just a moment here. So let me just, if I can, mention a few. One of the things that I've found, uh, surprisingly to me, to me it's sort of like a no-brainer. I can't imagine why you wouldn't do this, but uh, I simply just project onto the PowerPoint as one of my first slides in the presentation, the mission statement of the organization. And I can't tell you how many times the DM comes up to me, usually during the first break, and says, says to me, we have a mission? 
No, no, this, the, the decision maker says to me, um, that's really cool, you know, how did you find it? That's really great that you did that. I'm always trying to kind of reinforce that or whatever. And so referring back to it throughout the day, mission statement, target to be shooting for. Uh, something else that, um, that we want to do, of course, as we've talked about you know, quite a bit, we all went through this with Gary and his uh, program orientation, and of course, level two, so a minimum 50% interaction. That's why it's a little, a little bit um, somewhat, I, I feel a little bit like a fish out of water here, because this is not the way I train normally. I don't normally get up here and make sort of a, what I would consider to be almost like a keynote speech. It's highly interactive. Uh, but in the nature of the TED Talk that we're doing here, I'll stick with the format. So uh, I'm not going to tell them what we're going to cover today. I don't cover stuff. And, I know Anita made that point too. I'm all about creating the sort of environment where they can discover things that they can actually take back to the workplace. So I'm not covering stuff. That's not what I see envision as my job as. I like to engage participants offline at the break. Even if it's something as simple as, you know, I see uh, you know, a guy's got some, uh, you know, KC uh, gear on or something. Yeah, about those Chiefs, I can't believe it. 10 in a row, wow, amazing. Yeah, my charges are awful this year, or whatever. We can start talking about sports, or Matt mentioned yesterday in the commune in, or whatever. I really like that, and I find that offline, by using my interpersonal skills, I build up the credibility. You know, Kelly talked about ethos yesterday, and I sort of build up that credibility or enhance that ethos a little bit. So not only are they more engaged during the seminar, I often hear, as I'm sure you do too, things that haven't been brought up yet. And I fold those very subtly back into the rest of the program so we can actually you know, relate more with what's actually going on uh, with the organization. So be Socratic. In other words, be like that guy right there, Socrates. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you very much. I know you have one or two of you that have seen Bill and Ted's Big Adventure. Uh, debrief activity. So it's the so what question. Classic so what question. So we just went through this simulated role play or this brainstorming activity or whatever we just did. So I know it kind of felt like summer camp, but so why did we even do it? What was the point? How will you apply this? It's the application question. I am also very big on reading the walls. I'm sure many of you do that too in your organization during the breaks, during the lunch. I want to know what's up there. And I want to fold these things into the seminar, you know, recognizing achievements and, and values and anything else that I can sort of you know, build that, enhance that credibility, enhance that ethos a little bit. And even down to the point of you know, how do they refer to their employees? If I'm going to speak the lingo, are they going to be uh, direct reports or subordinates? or team members, how do they refer to the people that are on their team? And I want to use that language, kind of speak that language. How do we avoid unhappies? Yes, Anita made a great point about trusting the workbook. I want to beware of the recycled stories, especially with the same client. Not a good idea. And of course, I'm not going to end early unless the client wants me to. And modeling that enthusiasm, if I can't get excited about a subject, I'm not going to teach it. I hear a lot of people tell me after the seminar, I thought this was going to be really boring. Grammar and proofreading, oh my god. But you were so excited about it, you made it fun. You made it interesting for me to actually be in the class. So let's revisit as opposed to review. I hear the word review, and I think school, it's usually a room clearer. So we'll revisit some of the destinations we've been to, creating that great first impression, pursuing customer feedback, and using winning strategies to deliver tailored training. Now let's go to the ultimate test, ladies and gentlemen. Here it is, the game show of Kansas City. Everybody is talking about. That's right, it's On-Site Jeopardy. Hello, I'm your, <laughs> I'm your host, Gary Butterworth. And here it is, as you all know, to win On-Site Jeopardy, you have to actually formulate your answer in the form of a question. a question. The audience finally coming through for me. I appreciate that. Very nice, very nice. And so here it is. We have our, our final clue just for you. And good luck to all. Here it is. It's the secret the single biggest thing that leads to 100% on-site seminar satisfaction. And I'm looking for the first hand to go up. Here it is back here, yes sir. What is the $64 question? Hey, he's, he's got it. Congratulations everybody. In fact, we have a win, we have a grand prize and here it is, it is a ticket by golly, a ticket to Staples, congratulations. Don't spend it all in one place, yes my, absolutely. That's my little moment of kinestheticism, if there is such a word. All right, so finally, just to wrap things up here, where was I here? Oh, yes, because, so, <laughs> yes, thank you very much. That is the $64 question, ka-ching. Ka so there's our question, and just to wrap things up here, let's raise the performance bar way, way, way up 
Go beyond unhappies. We don't want to just get beyond unhappies. That's just off the shelf. We want to set the bar far higher than that. So let's deliver unforgettable, exceptional training and customer service. And make sure you have plenty of water, too, because I feel right now my voice is about shot. Uh, must make it a win, win, win for the client, Skill Path National, and for you as well. And there's our time, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. <laughs> I appreciate your time. Thank you so much.